Welcome to Region 14. My name is Sarah Lindball and I have the honor of serving our region as the Education Coordinator. And I'm so glad that you're here today because we're going to be highlighting some of my most favorite classes that took place at our recent event, Region 14 University. So our theme for Travel in Tune is Hospitality and Harmony. And I thought what better way to learn how to be hospitable than to share some highlights from classes that revolve around chorus culture. So our thought is that it's, it's best to be a warm and welcoming and accepting culture and environment and what better way to be hospitable. So without further ado, enjoy these clips. I'm really excited. I'm passionate about this topic. Um, it's a, it requires bravery. It requires self-reflection. So I'm hopeful that as we work on developing a better culture, it will help our organization, it will help our communities, ultimately it will help the world. I know that sounds very, you know, rainbows and butterflies, but all, all change starts locally. So um, we're going to get uncomfortable. And I, I would like for you just to feel, feel willing to sit with discomfort. Um, one of my favorite formulas, and I use this when I'm talking about music, I use this when I'm talking about culture, I use it in a lot of different areas of the world, is stress plus rest equals growth. So hopefully we can stress stress our thoughts a little bit in our brain, and then we can give it a rest, and then we can grow. How many of you have ever heard of, oh, this is a great quote I want to start with. One of the operational definitions of critical thinking is the ability to change your mind on a deeply held belief. It seems perfectly appropriate, appropriate to invoke this definition when you're trying to explain to someone else why they are wrong, but it's a lot harder to apply, apply inwardly. That resonated well with me. I think um, it's very easy for us to go around saying you all need to do that better and that better, but it's hard to self-reflect. This is from a book called Teaching with Respect. And uh, it's one of the resources, there is a handout available on the, my part of the website, however that works, you can download it, it has all that info. How many of you have ever heard of the graphic called the oatmeal? It's a, there's a website, they do, I mean, you call them cartoons, I mean, that's the style, they're not necessarily funny, um, but some of them are just great social commentary. Some of them are funny, some of them, they, um, the author, talks about things like depression. And in this particular case, I'm not going to read this entire um, cartoon to you, this entire graphic to you, but I have a handful of slides and I wanna give you the gist of what this is. And there's a website down there. Um, if you type in just to your Google search, the oatmeal believe, you'll find this whole thing. It is 100% worth your while. If we were doing a longer class, I'd do the whole thing. So. This talks about George Washington and it talks about his teeth and it talks about how we think that he had teeth that were made of um, wood, but they were actually made of like animal things and ivory and donkey teeth and things. And then it talks about, we think about that. And we're like, ooh, that's kind of gross, but okay, whatever. And then it says, hey, by the way, did you know he had another set of teeth and they were teeth of slaves? And what we're asking you, what they're asking you to do in this is notice your emotional reaction to those two bits of information. One was fairly easy to understand. You're like, okay, it's a little gross, but, and then the second one's like, oh, I have, I have deep emotions about that. And so the whole point of the exercise that you'll be brought through is to notice your emotional barometer when you're presented with new ideas and kind of understand why it's easy to accept some ideas and not others. Some we just listen to and, okay, that makes sense. I accept that, no problem. And some we just fight against. And we really hold our own beliefs tighter often. So often we'll not only ignore evidence, and I didn't really give you any for this other than just here's a story, um, but we'll often then dig our heels in deeper and believe more strongly our opposing view of what we were just told. 
<laughs> I like this. It turns out that bum crazy bonkers has a name in the world of neuroscience and it's called the backfire effect. It's a well-documented psychological behavior. Have any of you ever noticed this in yourselves? When somebody presents you with an idea that doesn't agree with your worldview and you go, ah, no one's ever noticed that? <laughs> You're just not willing to admit it? <laughs> so I, I need you to know that this is a normal thing. So you might encounter some things that don't necessarily sit with your worldview and that's okay. But we're wired to do this. We're wired to hold tighter to the things that we believe. And our brain considers this new information a threat. It's the same part of our brain, the amygdala that says, danger, danger, there's a tiger behind you when we're presented with new information, it feels life-threatening. I know that that sounds like a stretch, but it's the same part of our brain. And it, it gives us that riled up feeling, that adrenaline or that anger or that confusion often. And the brain is like, no, no, I'm gonna protect you. So I'm gonna keep this information away. And that's why we have this backfire effect. It's protecting your worldview, but your worldview is not meant to last forever right? It was meant to grow and change. And we want to be able to differentiate our emotions from our logic. And I really like how the author wraps this up and it says, how do I deal with this? And the author listens to all of the information and says, I let the emotional cortex fight its little fight. And then I listen. And then I change. Because this universe of ours is so achingly beautiful and we're all in it together. We're all going the same direction. And that right there, though we're, we're all going the same direction, I think we need to remember as we sit with anything that's uncomfortable and as we disagree and as we challenge one another that we're all on the same team, even if it doesn't feel like it. We all want what's best for ourselves and our neighbors. We often disagree about what the best way is to go about that. So why should we consider inclusion practices? And this is something that every person in every chorus is going to have to work out for themselves. Here are some reasons that I think they're important. Number one, I would like to be relevant to my community. I would like people to feel respected when they are part of my groups. I would like people to feel represented and that they are surrounded by empathy. Even if people can't 100% understand everything about them, that there is still a place for them and they feel safe. And this is where I want to get into culture, 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 and trust. So on the right, what you're looking at is, uh, I'm not sure if I can say invented, but let's say created chiefly by um, a woman named Zaretta Hammond in a book called Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain, which is where I took a lot of that earlier stuff as well. Um, this tree is meant to represent the trees that are inside each of us. The way that we used to talk about culture, I think if any of us are familiar, individual culture is like an iceberg. There's like the part that you see that's above the water and then there's this like huge bit that's under. And we've reframed that through Zaretta Hammond's work in terms of students in classrooms and can be applied across communities of any kind as a tree that has deep roots. And there are parts that you can subtly see but are harder to talk about. The top is called surface culture. This is the fruit that the tree bears. These are things that we can see. I can see the color of someone's skin. I can see the Jamaican colors on their clothing. I can see the way that their hair is styled. And I can talk with that person about that typically. We don't really even have a, an emotional, high emotional impact on those differences. I would expect to walk into a room and see people that don't necessarily look like me. We've established that in our communities. Um, and it, there's no differences that bring up words like right and wrong on the leaves of the tree. This is like what teachers on the phone may call bulletin board culture. 
where you're looking at lots of different faces of lots of different people. And thankfully, we grew up in an education system that did foster that, where we, we knew that not all people look exactly like Sam Bunting, right? That's all I mean. And we've come to expect a high level of diversity here and that it changes all around us. And it's, it's more of what I think people feel comfortable talking about. Hey, what, what did you grow up eating in your family? Um, I see that you, you also speak German. Um, is that, is that, did you grow up speaking German? These are maybe more comfortable conversations that we are all having. But underneath that is shallow culture. And underneath meaning in the trunk of the tree, the thing that makes the leaves grow. These are not things that you can see. Let's say you can't observe them, like put them on a bulletin board. These are things that are unspoken rules. You have them. Everybody that I can see right now in my view, I bet we all have them. And I would be willing to bet that most of us are probably feeling differently about at least one of them. But we won't know if, unless we talk about it, which we hardly ever do. This is where communication lives. How someone looks at you when you're talking. How close are they standing to you on the risers or in the sectional? How does it make you feel? Are you feeling a lack of safety? A lot of safety issues actually come from shallow culture, not surface culture, because we don't talk about them very often. But there is a high emotional impact on trust here. I'm going to give you a story. I work in developing curriculum for teachers, software and stuff, and I'm on the phone with lots of people all the time. And by the phone, I mean a Zoom call such as this. And I'm looking at people, I'm looking at their faces. And I grew up, uh, my, my mother and my father were Jewish. We tend to talk very fast. I probably should have been told to slow down already. I apologize. But I also tend to interrupt people. And I didn't know that about myself because my mother and I end up finishing each other's sentences all the time. It's actually like an act of respect in my family. I asked my mother, what would you do if I finished, if, if, if you were talking and I let you finish your story and I waited like five seconds before saying anything and her hand went to her heart and she said, I'd be so offended. <laughs> I'd be so offended. And I was like, right? How weird is it that I'm on these Zoom calls and I'm being told like, hey, I, I noticed you in that meeting. You wouldn't let me finish my sentence. Oh, oh I, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. Thank you so much for telling me. I'm going to be more careful of that. And I brought it to my mom. Like, I, I think I'm supposed to let them finish talking. Right? And she was like, oh yeah, I think you, I think you are. And it was totally different for us, right? Like, when I'm finishing my mother's story, she's seeing that as like, we're, we're like on the same page. Yeah, I totally get what you're saying, mom. But I, I can't just walk into any room and expect that that person has the same value in communication. So from that moment on, and this happened like two months ago, okay? I'm still discovering a lot of these things. I say to this woman that I'm working with, and I said, I said, hey, Terry, I've, I, I just realized something that every time I finish, you let me finish speaking a lot. And I gave her the story about talking to my mom. I said, and I invited her. I said, do you, am, am I, do you feel like I'm cutting you off a lot? And because I really want to work on making sure that I honor that you finish what you have to say. I just wanted you to have a very lovely reason as to why I might be doing that and stepping on the end of your sentences. And she said, I, I didn't even think to talk about it that way. Yeah, in my family, she then says, we, we don't do that. I remember getting into trouble when I was younger. And I was like, weird, I would have gotten in trouble the other way. Like, aren't you listening, Sam? is what my mom would have said to me. Um, other things happen in the schools all the time. Uh, students that get in trouble for not giving direct eye contact to their discipline, disciplinary person. Um, in a lot of cultures, eye contact is seen as disrespectful, especially when you're being disciplined. So if we don't investigate where our shallow cultures are different, despite our intent, we're causing lack of safety. And the best way that I have learned to deal with it is to have very open conversations about who I am. I don't ask a lot, tell me everything about yourself. I, that, that would be ridiculous. But I share a story about me that is about what I value and how I was raised. And I invite others to share with me. And there, there is a safety in that as well. So I wanted to spend a considerable amount of time there, enjoy my stories. Let's talk about deep culture. Oops, sorry. Deep culture is tacit, meaning it isn't necessarily learned explicitly. Why do I keep doing that? Sorry, friends. These are things that when we disagree on them, there are issues of right and wrong in our hearts sometimes. It's harder. It's, I remember when I was in school or, it, it, I mean, not that it only happened to me when I was young, and I find out that somebody sees the world differently than I do or the way that they talk about fairness 
their spirituality. When I saw those differences, I had to learn that not everybody sees the world the way that I do. These are much harder to tackle, but likely have the same routine as a solution. Sharing with each other where these differences are, um, it, I think in my practice right now, um, these are harder conversations to have and I need to have a really soft and open heart. Um, but they are, check out what's down here, you guys. Preferences for competition and cooperation. It's, that's in our deep culture. So I invite you to think about how, what was it like growing up with some of these terms? What did you decide as, an, uh, as not a young person or you know, coming out of your youth to change? Maybe you, maybe you had a family that you've raised. Maybe you are currently raising a family. Maybe you're thinking about raising a family. What kinds of values did you put in place? The notion of right and wrong down here is, is something that needs to come to the surface when it's relevant to the work that we're doing. And some of that stuff is right here. So we can have these conversations in safe ways if we understand and respect that our cultures simply make us different. It doesn't make us right or wrong, um, but they simply make us different. No matter what we look like, right? I mean, some of you laughed at my Jewish mom cutting each other off story. It's different. It might be different than the way that you were raised. But learning that about me will tell you why maybe I'm reacting in certain ways. And nature abhors a vacuum. Without my story, you can make one up. And we do this for a lot of people all the time. Uh, we don't have to. We can ask. I've noticed that you talk a lot, Sam. I'd be like, yeah, I do. My family was really quiet. They let me talk all the time. I never learned how to shut up. That's like legitimately my answer. But um, it reminds me that not everybody is me, which is weird, but it's true. <laughs> anyway, huge takeaway here is that achievement, our achievement as humans that are working together on something does not need to come at the cost of my culture. We don't actually have to culturally be the same to achieve. It shouldn't. We should be able to arrive into any room and be authentically who we are without creating a lack of safety for others. That's paramount. So I want us to start thinking about the fact that in every individual, there is going to be different kinds of thinking. So when we're talking about thriving, the first thing we have to talk about is thinking and safety and a whole bunch of things that go along with us being able to operate in an, in, at, at our optimal level in crisis situations or non-crisis situations. Because a lot of it is depending on how we view the situation and what we're doing with it. So let's just talk about some different styles of thinking first. So... I enjoy a bunch of different styles of thinking, but mostly I am a matrix thinker. I think in connected dots. I, I'm, you know, in Iron Man, anybody here see Iron Man, you know, when he like expands the world and it's like 3D and sees it, that's the way my mind works. I see that this dot over here is connected to that dot over there. And if we don't take care of this thing over here, you're never gonna get there. Now this drives people that I work with crazy when they are linear thinkers, A, B, C, D, you check things off the list. And I'm like, no, skip D. It's not important because if you're trying to get to L, <laughs> you're really going to need to focus on F. So skip D. You, you can come back for D. And it, it just makes people that are A, B, C, D a little bit crazy. But it's important for me to know that people need to go A, B, C, D because that makes them feel safe. So now that I have that information, I know a little bit about how I think, I can start working with people that are a little bit more linear in their thinking, and we can start working together. So in order to thrive, we have to understand a bit about ourselves, and we have to understand a bit about how other people operate and how to create a culture of safety so that when we're moving forward, we can have conflict and we can have disagreement and we can have strong debate about things that we need to change in our world or in our lives or in our organizations or in our choruses or music that we choose or virtual videos we put out or we don't put out or you know how we're going to run a zoom like name name the issue we can get along with other people in a in a more seamless way when we have a bit of an understanding about how people think 
So it's not really rocket science. Uh, we can't just put people in little containers because everybody is a little bit unique. So let's just talk about a few ideas of how people think. So matrix thinking is seeing a big expanse of things and seeing how dots connect. Inside that, you've got your linear thinkers. We've talked about A, B, C, D, logical list followers, stroke things off the list. And that is traditionally how people are taught to achieve things, A, B, C, D. But things don't actually add up that way in the real world because people are incredibly unpredictable. And situations are incredibly unpredictable. So we've got our A, B, C, D. Now we've got skip thinkers who go A, D, K, N, P, and they skip a bunch of things in the middle and then they try to come back and get them later because they logically can see how, how they can get through different things more quickly. So if you've ever been in a, in a situation with somebody who just thinks too fast, I, let me just tell you this much. The brain only operates at one speed. It, it's a neuron has an electrical impulse and then another neuron has an electrical impulse and electricity travels at the same, the speed of light is the speed of light. We don't really have control over that. And then there's chemicals that help, help the neurons talk to each other. And there's a certain plasticity that goes with all of that, that juice up there that helps us, uh, helps us put things together. But based on our experience and based on our neurodivergence, um, some people are more neurodivergent than other people, but if you ask me, everybody's a little unique in their own way. It's a little bit difficult to keep up with some people. They just kind of go at a bit of a clip, but that's, that's kind of how they're wired. Now, learning how to work with people like that is really exciting. And if you know how to do it, they could be your next best friend. If you're an ABCD person and you're trying to work with a skip thinker, well, you can do that. You don't have to make them do it your way and they don't have to make you do it their way either. Because here's the good news. There are other kinds of thinkers too. There's like web thinkers. And when I say web, I'm not talking about the, the worldwide. I'm talking about, if you look at it, you know, the arcs of silk in a spider web, they connect, but they all connect to these very strong threads. So there's some, there's some stability that happens branching out from a center. And then there are links made between them and they don't always line up, but they all create stability. And some people are able to just go, I map it this way. That thread's important, this thread's important, but I have these core elements that I must stick to that are very, very sound and stable. And recognizing that in a web thinker is important because then you're able to complement, okay, these, these things are important. The rest of it's negotiable. And that's important. I mean, all of this is really super important, especially right now when we're in a two-dimensional thing and we can't read people's body language. We need to ask questions. We need to ask what's going on here. Now there are spiral thinkers and you can tell the spiral thinkers generally like to process what they're thinking out loud and they don't really know what they're thinking until they hear it come out of their mouth. I have a little bit of that myself. So I will say, well, let's talk about topic X and everybody in the room that's going A, B, C, D is like focused on topic X. And as a matrix thinker, I'll go over to something over here and talk about something completely unrelated. And they're like, uh, okay, ADHD girl, please come back into the room. And I'm like, yeah, but this is gonna, this will come in handy later. And we'll, we'll talk around it and they'll finally get me back and we'll come back to X and I'll go, and that's why fire engines are red. And, and, and it'll all make sense but I have to go around the entire spiral to get there. Anybody here like this? When, when, when I'm looking at a, a creative group of people, a lot of creative thinkers are spiral and matrix thinkers. Now this drives some of the organizers absolutely crazy <laughs> because organizers like, I have to manage people and I need to stick to a plan. <laughs> now, <laughs> And this is tough because when you're dealing with creative people, like we all are, we have to leave enough space for these different kinds of thinkers to express themselves in order for them to feel safe in our communities. Now, remember this also, there are two kinds of people in charge of stuff. There are leaders and there are managers. Managers do things uh, the right way. 
leaders do the right thing. And sometimes you'll find that leaders will break a lot of rules in order to do the right thing. Now, do we need managers that are doing things the right way? Yes. Do we need leaders that are going to break the rules? Yes. Do they need to learn how to complement one another? Absolutely. Absolutely, without question. One of the most important things that ever happened to me in a, in a leadership development, um, a director seminar, actually, I just moved to Sweden. I did not speak very much Swedish. There's a very specific way to do things, um, you know, in, in new cultures, and you have to fit in and blend into that. And, um, and I've, I've always... Um, I've always had a bit of uh, a bit of my own opinion about how I should be as a leader. Uh, some of my background, I was in the armed forces uh, for quite a while. I was a sharpshooting instructor. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the military. So I, I know about rules and regulations. Um, but I learned some really good things from this one guy uh, named Sullivan, uh, Master Sergeant, Master Warrant Officer Sullivan. And he was teaching, he's one of the instructors when I was going through officer training. And he was one of those hard as nails guys that you would follow anywhere. And I didn't know why. And I asked him one day, why would I follow you anywhere? Like, I would do anything you say. Why? Why do you have this authority over me? No, I'm going to need this. And he said, your number one job is to help people do things you want done in a way that makes them think they thought of it themselves. And I'll tell you, that has stuck with me. So there I was over in Sweden at my very first director seminar, Brittle and Bonadol was our leader and uh, passed around to all of, all of the directors uh, was a piece of paper saying, you know, what are the things that you need to improve? And, and what's your plan for improving these things? And on my piece of paper, and my, my dear friend Magdalena was translating for me and on my piece of paper, and it's funny, every time I move, I find that piece of paper. <laughs> you know, when you try to throw out a piece of paper when you're moving and it just kind of keeps showing up because you clearly keep needing the message. Well, <laughs> so on my piece of paper, I had I had written. Um, well, I can I can understand what I'm not good at, but what I my number one thing to work on the things that I'm not good at is to actually find somebody who's really good at the stuff that I suck at and make really good friends with them. And hopefully I'm really good at the things they suck at. That's my plan. <laughs> I wanna look for somebody that's gonna compliment me so that I can also compliment them and together we, we can lift as we climb. And that, that has been one of my biggest leadership uh, application strategies. And I'll tell you, what it's done is it's freed me up to use my talents and skills and abilities to the best of their ability without struggling against the things that I feel I, is a deficit. Remember, the first thing I said to you is we are going to come from a place of abundance. No more judging for what you aren't. There's no room to judge who we aren't and who we aren't going to be in our lifetimes. I can only be as much as I can be, and I am not going to be all of the person that I expect myself to be. Because I have incredibly high expectations of myself, that means I will carry an incredibly high stress load of who I think I should be to all people at all times. That's something I will work on for the rest of my life. That's a personal thing I will work on for the rest of my life. And in order to become better at self-love and self-regard and allow my skills, talents, and abilities to be used to their maximum strength, I need to channel my energy towards the things I'm really, really good at and look for people that are really good at the things that I'm marginally good at or really suck at and allow them to thrive. This means you make space in your world for somebody else to rise. And when you're trying to be a leader or uh, you're in charge of something and you feel the responsibility of being in charge of things, it's really hard to let go of that control and trust. But when people see you creating a sense of trust, whether you're in leadership or you're a person on the risers, which is its own kind of leadership. When people see you trusting other people, when people see you cooperating with other people and working together, it creates and fosters a culture of trust. Now, I cannot, under, I cannot underscore this enough for, for folks. Trust and safety are the number one things we need in order to thrive as creative human beings. 
number one, more than skills. If you want your course to be successful, develop a culture of trust. Build from culture first and build your structures around the culture of safety that you develop. It affects everything. And you're gonna hear some of the people here today uh, or this weekend are gonna be talking about the polyvagal system and the sympathetic nervous system and how we deal with cultures and how we create safety in our cultures. You're gonna hear a lot about that this weekend. But the number one thing is when you're talking to a person, you're talking to a person and that person is unique. And it's so easy when there's so many of us to feel like this group of people or our section or this chorus or the front row or, you know, these people, you know, that show up or don't show up, you know, to, to events. It's really easy to, to start compartmentalizing people, but it's really super important, especially now for us to look into the camera and look at a person. So here's a couple of tips for Zoom that you can do. You can look at your screen. Okay, I'm gonna look at Kathy Grant. There she is. Hey, Kathy Grant. Look at that face. <laughs> I'm looking at Kathy Grant. I've got you in my eyes and now I'm gonna look in the camera and I'm gonna say, hi, Kathy Grant. And she can see me looking at her because she's in my mind. She doesn't have to be in the room with me to be in the room with me. So when we're in this two-dimensional, seemingly two-dimensional um, opportunity, this is an opportunity, the master uses everything, for us to really connect with people and really see them. It's hard and it, like you'll see that I have backlighting and I have side lighting and I've invested a couple of bones in getting some lighting so that people can see that I'm three-dimensional instead of a two-dimensional character. Our, we're getting Zoom fatigue because our human brains have not evolved enough in what the whole 10 minutes since we've been living on Zoom to understand visual clues from a two-dimensional platform. So the more we can make our environment a three-dimensional platform, like Anne's got a really good, Anne Rome's got a really nice three-dimensional platform there. You can see the books are clearly smaller than she is. The lighting is coming from the side. You can see some outline on her face. It really helps a lot. So just a little bit of lighting goes a long way, friends for people to be able to see you and make this environment a little bit safer for people so that they don't feel so fatigued and so tired. So if you've got, if you've got it within you, I highly recommend you know pulling a lamp over <laughs> or doing whatever you can, get creative with it, you're creative people. So that's, that's that. Um, the next thing that we can do, now that we've talked a little bit about how we think, we've talked a bit about safety being one of the number one things, and we've talked about developing our culture and then structuring around our culture as being one of the things that builds the, the strongest community that we possibly can. Let's talk just a little bit, who are we? This is a time, this is a, a delicate and precious time where we are not, forgive me for saying this, we are not distracted by making music and we have the opportunity to clean house. We have the opportunity to clean up those things that we take for granted, to ready ourselves for a whole new community of people that after this are going to need healing through music. For a new community of people that after this are gonna be looking for ways that they can belong to people that might be completely different than them. People are going to look for ways that they can connect with other people. And they're gonna start looking for any clue that leads them closer to the hearts of one another. We're living in a very weird time. So much has happened just even in the past decade that has just been incredible. And, and the generations coming up after this that, that uh, are being born now, they will have missed what we've lived through, which is pretty incredible. When, when you read those articles about the last pandemic in the 20s, you know, from 1919 onward, uh, we, look, we look back at that. Do you remember reading some of those articles at the very beginning of this pandemic? We look back at those things and it's like, oh, that was so long ago. Nobody ever talked about it. Nobody talks about it. It only came up because there's a new pandemic. We are going to be those people someday to somebody else. There's going to be a generation of people that look back and go, oh, there was a pandemic in 2020. 
And right now it's the only thing that we can see. There's life after this and there is life during this. There are so many things you can do to enrich yourself as a musician, as a person, study, like what kind of a thinker am I? Get together with somebody else on this call, take, take, take note of their name and look them up afterwards and say, hey, Marilyn, what kind of a thinker are you? And have a conversation with Marilyn. I've never met Marilyn. It would be great to know what kind of a thinker she is, you know? And oh, really, you think that way? Just start having conversations with one another and find out how many different kinds of people there are and how you're going to interact with them. All of this goes to say that when we start building how we are going to interact with a variety of people, when we're open for business again, we'll be that much more equipped to put out the signals of welcome to people who feel like they're different. And you know what? Almost everybody feels like they're different. And chances are in the creative world that we live in, everybody's got a little something going on. Everybody, every single creative person that I've ever met, if you talk to them long enough, they divulge some secret about, about some difficulty that they've had as a learner, as a person, in their personal life, in their family life. Some, everybody got something. Everybody has a thing. That's the way it is. So I'm going to share with you now a little thing that's uh, part of my thing um, because it's important to this story and it's, it's really beautiful. Now, when I was first diagnosed uh, with autism, I felt very ashamed and I didn't want to tell anybody. And I thought nobody will ever know. I mean, I grew up with the stigma um, of having a diagnosis, but nobody really confirmed it. They didn't want to put me on medication. They didn't want to put me in special schools. Uh, and I grew up thinking I was dumb, uh, that I was slow, that I was supposed to be in a special school and I probably should have been because I wasn't very good at school. Um, and that's how I kind of grew up with all of those, those, th those thoughts. Now, just before my mother passed away, I asked her about the special school and she said, no, 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 it was actually it's a, it wasn't a school for special needs people. It was a, a school for, for gifted people. On the, and here I am with autism. And I was in the public school system struggling, struggling, struggling because I didn't have the support that I needed. Now, as an adult, I kind of find my way. And it made me a stronger person in many, many ways because I had to survive. I had to find what my thing was that I could thrive at. And it happened to be music. And thank goodness I found communities of musicians that said, you know what, we value you and see you for who you are and we encourage you and we want you to thrive. And they put that wind under my wings and away I went. And my mother was one of them. She was a, a concert pianist. So I, I was raised in music and thank goodness for this. It gave me my escape from the things that weren't working for me. So some years later, I'm sitting in Sweden I, I, my, my chorus uh, was suddenly this little chorus that could on the international scene. And we started arriving in the top 10 uh, and scoring A's with, you know, 40 people on the risers. And, and, it, and we built our chorus culture much the way that I've described to you already by building safety, understanding, understanding how people think, understanding how people can cooperate, strengths with strengths, challenges with people with other strengths and making a lot of space for debate, discourse, uh, negotiation, uh, dissent. Like it's all okay. It's okay to disagree. It's okay to debate. You don't all have to agree about the same thing, but you have to agree that you respect one another. That is the number one thing. So there I was sitting, trying to arrange a piece of music for my chorus. We were about to go to Hawaii in 2013. I was terribly depressed. Um, I was just in a really bad place. And I, 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 I really couldn't get out of my robe and off the couch. I just could not motivate, motivate myself to do anything. And I was responsible for all these people. And I felt the pressure of the world on me. We'd just been this, you know, Stockholm City Voices who just like did this thing in Seattle and all eyes were on us. And 
I felt so responsible to do something for the beautiful people in my chorus. And so I decided that one of the songs we needed to do, should we make the finals, was uh, You Are So Beautiful to Me. I thought, that's the song we have to do. And I sat on my, my couch with my laptop and my keyboard. And I didn't think of any of the theory that went around it. Uh, I, 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 I did pick, you know, what's the lowest note the basses can sing and what's the highest note the tenors can sing. And that's pretty much the book ends. I picked the key and then I just kind of sat there with the keyboard and thought of all of the people that I loved that would be in the audience that were my champions and how they would feel when they heard the, these beautiful souls and voices singing the chords that I was hearing in my head. And that's all I thought about. I thought about Joey Mitchell, you know, sitting in the audience. I thought about Bonnie Fideski, you know, some of my, my very close friends that I've made over the years. I thought of them sitting there listening to this and, and the sound washing through them in a way that helped them go, I know how I feel when I feel beautiful. This makes me feel beautiful. And that's all I could think about. I knew that I knew my chorus could sing it beautifully. I knew they were beautiful humans and their self-expression would be in it. And I just needed to make sure that the right vehicle was there for that to happen. Now, this in and of itself is important. Here's the really cool part. A year later, we performed this in Hawaii and, and people really, really loved that piece of music. And, and it did have that impact on my friends and it did have that impact on people that became my friends and people I didn't even know. It was, it was really super beautiful. And it was really, uh, it was really a, um, a gift to all of us to be able to, to partake in that moment with an audience that was so caring for us as well. So a year later, I was in Baltimore and a woman pulls me aside and says, I have to tell you something about your performance last year in Hawaii. Um, my son, who's uh, on the autism spectrum, he, uh, he's never been affectionate with me in his life. He's like 15 years old. He's never been really affectionate with me. He's never told, told me he loves me. He's, he's, he's high functioning, but he's never been able to connect with me that way. We were sitting down and watching the webcast of you in Hawaii, and they're in Calgary, Alberta from this group from Sweden in Hawaii, beaming up, you are so beautiful to me into the sky, down into this computer in Calgary, Alberta. And this kid, this 15 year old kid who's autistic, sees this, hears it and turns to his mom for the first time and says, mom, you're so beautiful to me. Now she tells me the story and I'm like, I can't even. Because all I can think of is something in my little autistic body, in my brain, in my heart, in my soul, put something into that thing that somebody else got. He got it. He got it. We connected. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't too long later that I was out in Calgary going to a hockey game with him, you know. And I tell you that story to say that whatever heart and soul you put in to what you do that is pure and right and good and good for human beings regardless of anything else about them just the fact that they have a beating heart and they are inhaling and exhaling oxygen if you put something that pure and right into your creative endeavors and your relationships and your effort to understand your relationships with yourself and your relationships with others and what you can give more than what you can take, you will connect with other human beings on a deeper level than any superficial stuff that might tear us apart or keep us separated. And that is unique to you. That is your one number one gift right now or ever. That is your number one gift as a creative human being to put into this world more than you take out. You don't have to be extraordinary. You just have to be absolutely real and thorough.
And that, that is the foundation of helping another human being feel like they belong somewhere. That is the foundation of some person who walks into your chorus, who's never heard barbershop or hears you singing in a pizza parlor and says, what's that? They're connecting to that meta harmony that we help create. And it has nothing to do with how excellent it is. Although it helps, it's easier to hear harmony when it's really good or when you've made an effort, but you have everything that you need to be harmonious in this life with other human beings. And when they are attracted to that thing, they will want to sing with you. They will want to sing with you, even if they're singing a different part or a different note, or it might seem like it's dissonant, or it might seem like it's clashing or it rhythmically doesn't line up. There's something special about you. And our number one job as performers, as creatives, as musicians, is the same as our number one job as a human being. It's to make space for other people in our lives. It's to make space for other people to thrive. And the more that we do that, the better this world becomes. My mother used to say, you know, never dim your light so someone else can shine because the whole world gets darker. But here's the secret. We all get to shine if that's what we make up our mind to be able to do. And there are a lot of different cultures and beliefs and a whole bunch of things, but there are some things that we cannot change about who we are. And those things that we are born with, not, not necessarily like the cultures that we grow up in, you know, after we're formulated, but the things that we come out right away that are absolutely sure about who we are, those are the things we need to look to other people and celebrate in them. I need to celebrate you. I need to figure out how I'm going to celebrate you. Not what you believe, not what you think, not what experience you are or church you go to or what political party you believe in. That, that stuff is kind of extra. I'm talking about the stuff that when that stuff falls away, the person, that little person that today has, has a little, shows up with their little broken heart and needs it healed. That's the person that harmony touches. The rest of it is extra. Harmony is, harmony is magic. Harmony is something there are no words for. The harmony that we sing, the music that flows from us is an expression of our assertion of our right to be alive. It is the assertion of our right to exist. And when we take somebody else's harmony in, when we are also making harmony, we are affirming their right to equal space in our space. I can't think of anything more inclusive than that, but I sure know that we get in our own way a lot, a lot of the time trying to make ourselves feel safe when some of what we can do is actually make ourselves not worry about stuff that actually isn't that much of a, a problem. We put a lot of conditions, you know, in getting people to sing barbershop. There's a lot of conditions. You got to have enough money. You got to know your part. You got to show up to rehearsals all the time. You got, there's a lot of hurdles to jump over. You got to sing this kind of music, this kind of way. What if we stood inside and looked out and said, how can I make the harmony that I sing more accessible to more people? You know what that makes? That makes more opportunities for me to connect with human beings on a really superhuman level. And that's gonna enrich who I am. I'll be changed by other people. And today I'm willing to, I'm, I'm willing to let that happen. It's taken me a long time to get there. I, I mean, I started my, my barbershop thing going, this is wonderful. And then I got really competitive. And it's like I had to beat people. And then, you know, so-and-so, you know, I didn't want to stand by them on the risers because they didn't know their part or like there's all these conditions. But if I let that melt away and I remember moments like in Sydney, coaching in Sydney, Australia, and there's a woman on the risers 
who had lost much of her hearing in a car accident. She was a great singer, but she, and she's a baritone. She's like, I have to stand by other baritones because I can't hear. I, I've lost like 90% of my hearing and I can't hear. She had a beautiful voice, but she was so insecure. And I, I placed her on the back row with no baritones around her so she could hear herself. And she started singing out. You know, it was just one of those, I didn't know if that was right or wrong, but everybody was like, no, you've got to contain this. You've got to contain this. I'm like, why don't we just give her a chance to see what she does on her own? And, and she did this thing. And I tell you what, like it's experiences like that. Like where else would I have met this person? Otherwise I would have said, oh, she's not singing in tune very well. You know, we better put her near somebody. You know, she, maybe she, she, maybe she can't be in contest because, you know, she's, she's off a little bit, Well, why don't we find a way to help her thrive? You know, why don't we find these solutions? Because we can, because we can, we're human beings. We are so smart and we have such good hearts. We have such good intent. What if we just made more space for somebody else's experience? What if we just did that? What if we just said the things I think are super important Are they that important? What can I do today with my gifts, talents, and abilities to learn about how somebody else thinks, how somebody else works, how somebody else is completely different experience? I mean, some people might think that I'm super mouthy and opinionated, but I'm also on the autism spectrum and I don't really have a filter for when I shouldn't be opinionated. I could be very, I have been very judged for that, but you know what? It's who I am. And Me being open about that helps people understand that it's not something that they have to fear. Isn't that cool? Like, and, and, and again, I remind you, everybody has a thing. Everybody has a thing. You are going to need somebody else's acceptance as much as somebody's going to need yours. you are going to need somebody else to support the harmony that you want to make as much as somebody else is going to need you. And it might not be today, but it will be at some point. And when we are ready to give, when it's time to receive, we'll know what it looks like. We'll have the humility to be able to do that. But first we need to champion other people. And it starts right now with our our Zoom meetings is an opportunity for us to actually get to know people a lot better. Your your participation in your choruses right now is paramount to building your community. You talking about how you're gonna clean up your choruses so that they are ready to receive a broader spectrum of human beings that will be coming out of a pandemic, not looking to join a thing, but definitely wanting to know that they belong somewhere. This is your chance before the doors open again to clean house, to make sure that you are prepared for the generosity that the universe has for you. You don't have to be better. You just have to accept the fact that you are already better and then look at what's in your way. What's standing in your way from operating with your best talents, skills, and abilities. Everybody has stuff standing in their way. And until I draw my last breath, I won't be done. I won't be done trying to to do the job to figure out how I can be a better conduit for the music that flows in me. It's a human job. If you wanna be a better musician, be a better human. If you want to be a better human, be a better musician who's a better human. (laughs) Because music challenges us to step up. It challenges us to move past, past the, the barriers that we put, the social barriers we put on other people. But it also means that we have an opportunity to be on stage and say something important. Now, there's a lot of talk. Uh, you know, a lot of people are having a lot of difficulty with some of the nostalgic songs that we sing in barbershop are really being questioned. And 
this is not unique to barbershop by the way any organization that sings nostalgic um, songs from um, previous centuries in American music are having the same conversations about what's what you know some of it being less appropriate and and outdated and not not contemporary with what we know about human beings today so I know that there are a lot of heavy feelings about this stuff but let's just unpack that for a quick second um, for me the reason I don't sing a lot of these songs anymore is because I actually don't relate to them now you guys are in the south I know there's some aspects of some of these songs that you do relate to but the reality is is that today's modern person why don't we why don't we say things about today's modern person about our condition of who we are today um, if you want to talk about the history of some of the Tin Pan Alley songs and things that were written, you know, previous to that, a lot of these songs were written by immigrants who were trying to adapt to a new world and they were forced into cities. A lot of them came from like the old country and they longed to go back to like nature, to something simple, to like trees and grass and houses. And the closest thing that they could relate that to in America happened to be like the images of the South. Did you guys know this? I, I recommend a book called Reinventing Dixie. It's a really good book. And it talks a lot about songwriting in that era, which, and I'm a songwriter, so it totally thrills me. Uh, really good book. Um, but, you know, as a Canadian girl, I can't actually relate to that. That's not my story. But as a songwriter, I'm looking forward to an opportunity to write a whole bunch of songs that matter to us now, like post-pandemic songs. <laughs> Maybe there's going to be a whole market of new songs but think about like you know when some of these songs might go away but think about some of the new opportunities that are made for people like me songwriters uh creatives that are in in the barbershop world that can actually write songs that suit the barbershop harmony style i mean this is a whole area of the world that hasn't been invented yet coming out of this pandemic there's a whole area of of how we're going to gather that hasn't been invented yet, but we've been practicing how to do that and keeping educational things alive online in Zoom. I mean, there are so many opportunities right in front of us. If we take the best of what's behind us and then focus forward, we can start using our skills at a higher level, finding other people that we can work with that are complement our challenges. We have strengths where they have challenges and we team up together and we move forward. We can really do something with barbershop. It can become the people's folk music again. This, this type of harmony is so unique and precious. And we are the guardians of the next generation that's going to receive this. And, and we're in a pandemic. And we're about to you know, start emerging from this, probably keeping an online educational moment alive and, and meeting in person eventually. I mean, there are so many opportunities in front of us and it all starts with you being the human that you are, bringing what you've got, looking for people who compliment you, not complicate you and making harmony happen, bringing your whole self. Yeah, and let it, just letting go, letting go of the small stuff and focusing on the reality. People can be changed through music. People can be healed through music. People can be healed through harmony. People that don't have anybody else to turn to or any place else to go, but have one thing they can do. They can make music. They need your welcome. They need your open heart. They need your spirit. You're the spirit. You're region 14. I wish you all incredible health and wellness and wholeness and fierce power in your search to be better humans, richer musicians, more generous souls. Thanks for inviting me tonight.